Hi there. My name is Aaron Weiner. I'm an addiction psychologist, and today we'll be talking about harm reduction for opioid use disorders. We're going to talk a bit about what's going on with the opioid epidemic in the United States, about how we can understand opioid use problems, what harm reduction looks like with opioids, and then within a family medicine context, what we can potentially do about it. So before we dive in, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. First is that the webinar today is brought to you in partnership with the University of Arkansas Little Rock Mid-South Division and the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, Community Health, and Education Division. Additionally, if you have any questions about today's presentation, please feel free to reach out to me via email. Uh, it's down here in the bottom left, Aaron at WeinerPhD.com more than happy to chat with you uh, whenever you watch this recording uh, I, I, i'm there for you if you have any questions that are outstanding uh, so that being said we've got a lot to get through in 30 minutes so let's dive right in starting with an overview of the opioid epidemic with uh, what's what's going on now because this has been an ongoing problem for quite some time uh, where we're at at the moment is that in the past 12 months there have been 79,562 deaths due to opioid, uh, opioid specifically, and that's 75% of all drug overdose deaths. This is the current leading cause of accidental death in the United States uh, in, in front of motor vehicle accidents, which is at 40,990. So to put this uh, in uh, with a point of comparison, the total number of U.S. deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan over the entirety of the wars there was 7,057. So this is uh, every year we're, we're losing 10 times as many folks, a, tr a tremendous amount of people dying from accidental overdose, specifically from opioids and even greater numbers, generally speaking. Uh, another way to think about it, there's 217 people dying daily from this and then thousands who are treated in emergency departments daily for non-fatal overdoses. And over 6 million people in the United States have an opioid use disorder or OUD for short. When we look at the deaths over time, we can see that the overdose rate has just been going up and up and up and up and up over the past decade or so, with a, a big spike, unfortunately, in, uh, in the pandemic years. Most recently, we've got some cause for, I'd say, cautious optimism. Uh, not to say that we haven't seen uh, a little drop in the past, like you can see there, but we've actually, in the past year, gone down by about 4.5% nationally. Now, there are certain parts of the country, um, those more west in particular that are still struggling with increasing rates uh, but this is this is very very good to see that things are potentially starting to, to trend in a positive direction we still have a long way to go though if we look at the slide that we were just at you know in terms of even getting back down to 2019 levels much less uh 2015 or, or before but hopefully this trend continues that said we can't necessarily back off what we're doing. Uh, there's only forward in terms of where we need to go to continue to make this better. Now, how do we do that though, is a critical question and still an open question. And understanding where we need to go from here requires an understanding of where we've come from. So if we look back here at the beginning of the opioid epidemic, when we really started to see increases, the first wave in increase in overdose death had to do with prescription medications. That uh, That's that green line. And we'll track it over time as we get further on. But this is where we first saw this increase. And the, the main reason for this was opioids at the time were being very overprescribed. And there was a lack of understanding of how addictive these products really were. This was a large scale study that was looking at the chances that someone was still going to be on opioids one or three years later, depending on the length of their initial opioid prescription. And you can see that even at 10 days, one in five people would have been on it a year later, and three years later was one in 10. You kick out to 30 days uh, of a prescription, which is very common post-surgically, say in certain orthopedic uh, procedures, spinal procedures, even uh, some dental procedures. And at that point, one in three people, and this was looking at hospital records, would still be looking, uh, would be on opioids uh, a year later, and one in five three years later, and then there's another big jump here at 31 days, right? So if people are on it for over a month. So these definitely had addictive properties that were being under-acknowledged and underappreciated. 
And as a result, actually, we've seen a big change in prescription patterns. There was this peak in prescribing in 2011, 2012. And then over time, as we started to really diagnose the problem and that, that the prescriptions and what was coming out of pharmacies was a big part of the issue, that has, has th those have gone down. Unfortunately, though, overdose deaths, as we looked at, have not coincided. And uh, th there's a couple reasons for that, but it has to do with how things started to change. So we're going to break this down now. The second wave in overdose deaths came from heroin. That's this purple line, her heroin related deaths, which uh, started to increase in the early 2010s. And, and those peaked at about 2015. Now, part of the reason for this, and this was coinciding also with prescription pill overdoses, is that as we started to get wise to what was happening with prescriptions, providers stopped prescribing them as much. And as a result, those who were already in the pipeline towards having more advanced opioid use problems and potentially overdose had to get their opioids from somewhere or they go into withdrawal. And so they went to the street. And heroin costs less than prescription pills because it is cheaper, essentially, to obtain and also because it's less safe. Uh, but as a result, that led people to be overdosing more on heroin. Then in the mid to late 2010s and coming now into the 2020s, fentanyl really started taking off. That's that wave three, that blue line that is not, as you can see, not going down. And fentanyl is a highly potent opioid, uh, as, as many of you watching this are aware, can be up to a thousand times as strong as morphine. And what that means, though, is that if someone who's opioid naive comes in contact with fentanyl, there's a very strong chance that it's going to, to push them over the top. And, and actually, at the time of this recording in June of 2024, about a month ago, the head of the DEA uh, testified in front of Congress saying that 70% of the illicit drug supply right now is either uh, contaminated with fentanyl or intentionally contains fentanyl. So it's highly prevalent right now. So it's very easy for folks to come in contact with this. The fourth wave that we're seeing now as well is fentanyl combi uh, combined with stimulants like methamphetamine or cocaine. And now that's taking up a greater slice of what we're seeing. And if heroin is cheaper to obtain and to produce on the drug supply side than prescription pills are, Fentanyl is even less expensive because it's created in a lab. Because it's so concentrated, it's easier to ship to get into the country. And that's part of what's driving this huge influx in fentanyl. Visualized another way, uh, what you're looking at here is a fatal uh, overdose without fentanyl or stimulants at all. And you can see that that used to be the majority back in 2010 and now is the minority. Stimulants without uh, fentanyl uh, is this, uh, this one here this gold one, you can see that's been pretty consistent. But look at the fentanyl portion. That's the red and then the light, uh, kind of like the, the salmon color. That went from very little back in 2010 to over 50% now in 2021. And again, that's driven very much by what's happening with this, this uh, accidental fentanyl exposure. And actually, kids are the fastest growing demographic of overdose death due to fentanyl. Uh, in the last few years. This is, if you look at this graph here on the left, 2019 through 2021, you can see this is for adolescents in particular, and just fentanyl has exploded. Now, further compli uh, comp uh, complicating issues around uh, opioids and overdoses is, is that now we're seeing different types of tranquilizers being mixed in to fentanyl because it theoretically, uh, it extends the effect of, of the euphoria if this is mixed in. But unfortunately, xylazine, which is what we're looking at in this graph, the percentage of, uh, of fentanyl deaths with xylazine detected are having going up and up and up. Xylazine is an animal tranquilizer. Uh, it does not respond to naloxone, the opioid overdose reversal agent. And so if someone's being sedated both by opioids and by xylazine, it means it's harder to revive them than if they were not. We're also seeing more and more prevalence of a different type of opioids called nitazines. Now, ISO is the most common that we hear about, but there are quite a few, and much like fentanyl, they can be up to 10, uh, excuse me, a thousand times as strong as morphine. Here's a list of the most common nitazines, and you can see ISO about two thirds of the way down there. Uh, but it's up to a, a thousand times as strong, again, synthetic and relatively inexpensive to produce. However, part of what makes nitazine so concerning is that they are more resistant to naloxone than fentanyl is and may require additional doses. There was one study 
uh, from 2023 that found that 66 percent of those who had an overdose with nitazines required more than two doses of naloxone to be revived versus 36 percent of those with fentanyl uh, and we're starting to find this also being mixed into other drugs so that's the the overall landscape that we're looking at uh, it's, it's, it's concerning and it's broad and it's ever shifting Again, I'm recording this of June of 2024. Uh, there will be a, a number of components of this that will remain the same if you are watching this a year or two later, but there's probably going to be parts that have changed as well because this is a constantly, unfortunately, constantly moving target uh, where there's always new compounds, new tactics, new laws that are being enacted. Uh, but that being said, what is more present now and what is also going to be sticking around is the paradigm of harm reduction. So I want to talk a little bit about what it is and then how to think about it in terms of enacting these sorts of uh, procedures in primary care. So what harm reduction is about is if you've got an individual who's not ready to discontinue use, if they're not uh, ready for abstinence or interested in abstinence, how do you reduce the harms? And th this is the reason why someone might not be ready to stop using is that addiction is actually a very complicated syndrome. Even if the optimal option for personal health would be uh, to, to abstain from use of a certain substance, it's not always accepted for a number of reasons. It ha might have to do with biological factors. It might, there might be psychological or social factors that are anchoring somebody in place. Fear of change or difference is another very strongly motivating factor when it comes to addiction. But however you look at it, there might be certain folks who at some point, you know, if, if we could see the future, would make it to that point where they're no longer using, but at the time you're coming in contact with them, they're not willing to accept that step. And so the question is, how do we reduce the risk of the most destructive sequelae of opioid use occurring? Uh, at least, again, within the context of opioids, you can take harm reduction, the paradigm, to different places as well. But some consequences that we want to avoid people experiencing would be things like uh, the social problems that might come from uh, being in, uh, in, in contact with uh, unlawful elements, sedation and functional impairment, perhaps getting into car accidents, legal complications if they are, you know, using and having on their person substances that are uh, illicit. You know, what would happen if they were caught with those things? Uh, a progressive sequence of addiction where they're falling more and more and more into opioid use, which has a ripple effect throughout their life. Infectious diseases are a huge concern, particularly with intravenous use, where you might be using dirty needles, contracting hepatitis, HIV, etc. Physical complications and concerns of opioid use, such as wounds that can emerge, again, particularly if you're injecting and it's been contaminated with xylazine uh, or other substances, uh, constipation just from you know opioid use generally, but not other physical problems that come from use. And then, of course, accidental death and overdose, which we talk about uh, quite a bit and for good reason. That would be a, a severe harm that is, that is irreversible, potentially. Uh, and then suicide also is linked to opioids. Uh, and just very briefly about this one, uh, what we found is that folks who are using opioids have a higher risk of suicide. This was a study of veterans, but just those who are using opioids actually are at a higher risk for suicides than those who are not. And those who are misusing, that's this very tall uh, bar is uh, that they, if they're misusing opioids, they are far more likely uh, from a statistical uh, perspective to have engaged in suicidal behaviors than those that are not. So, so many different areas where if we can reduce the amount of opioids that someone is using or move them to something that's less harmful formulation in general, they will be much better off. So let's first start talking about opioid related harm reduction options if the opioids have been prescribed because that is also an important consideration are these substances that someone has been prescribed and they are using in the manner of, that they have been prescribed them or are they misusing the opioids in some way or are they uh, buying them off the street we have to think about those sometimes a little bit differently so if someone has been prescribed an opioid, one thing that you can do is gradually lower a prescribed dose. If say they are on a high dose and they need to go lower. And this is something that ideally is done non-aggressively <clears throat> because a fear of withdrawal and experiencing withdrawal symptoms can very much shake somebody out 
of uh, whatever progress they're having. It can be very destabilizing. So doing it slowly, definitely very helpful. If you don't have it handy, I recommend bookmarking a morphine equivalent calculator because not all opioids are the same strength. Uh, this on the slides that you'll be able to download, you can click this link and go to one online, uh, but you can find these again by, by just searching for them or here's a quick conversion chart as well. But something like say hydrocodone is one to one with morphine, a morphine equivalent unit. Uh, hydromorphone though, uh, or Dilaudid, you know, that's that's four times as strong. Oxycodone is one and a half times. So as you're thinking about how much is somebody on and what do I want to lower them to, knowing the conversion rate is very important. Some cutoffs to think about. The widely accepted lowest risk dose for someone to be on for opioids, generally speaking, is 20 morphine equivalents per day. So uh, that would be, say, 20 milligrams of hydrocodone, that would be five milligrams of hydromorphone. Um, the next cutoff is at 50, ideally, if not under 20, under 15 morphine equivalents per day. The next cutoff at that next highest level of risk for overdose is 90 or 100, depending on the study that you read. But I like to recommend 90 just because that one is definitely on the safe side of that cutoff. So depending on why someone is using the, the opioids, particularly if this is for, uh, say, chronic pain or they're getting a monthly prescription, under 20 is fantastic, under 50 is second best, but anything over 90 is much higher risk than under 90. So you also want to consider appropriateness of non-opioid intervention options for pain. <clears throat> so you can lower that dose by potentially switching somebody to a different uh, management strategy, maybe even one that's better uh, integrated or has, rather has a better evidence base. You also uh, should definitely consider co-prescribing naloxone. And actually in Arkansas, it is required according to law if you are prescribing over 15 morphine, uh, 50 morphine equivalents, if there is also a prescription or use of benzodiazepines, which uh, interacts with the opioids to increase overdose risk, or if there's a history of OUD or overdose. So this should be something that's already on your radar but just having it there as a matter of course is very useful. So the next topic that we should talk about, and ideally again in family medicine, this will be more prevalent, is medications for opioid use disorder or MOUDs for short. And uh, we'll talk about specifically what those are in a second, but the idea behind them is that if you imagine that addiction, that opioid use disorder is a biopsychosocial concern, where there's a biological component to it, there's a psychological component to it and a social component to it, when you prescribe a medication for opioid use disorder, you're taking the biological part and you're just taking that out. So you're taking out cravings, you're taking out uh, the intoxic you're blocking intoxication, and there's no withdrawal, which allows someone then to work on, ideally, the psychological and social side to it. Now, how this works is essentially what you're doing is you're filling the opioid receptor site in the brain with either a full opioid agonist, but with a long half-life, that's uh, methadone. Uh, you're filling it with a partial agonist, which is what you're looking at down there, which is a buprenorphine is what we use for that, where you're filling the receptor site, um, but without quite as strong of an opioid signal. Or in the case, case of naltrexone, which we'll get to in a second, with an opioid antagonist. So it fills the site so you're not having uh, any cravings, but it's not an opioid agonist at all. So there's, it's not, uh, there's no chemical dependency there. What all of those medications have in common is a very high binding coefficient between the receptor site and the molecule. And what that means is that because it's bound so tightly, if they do use, if someone uses a substance, like say someone was to use heroin while they're on buprenorphine or methadone, they're not necessarily going to experience the effect of that heroin, which means that if their intention is not to use, they can catch themselves, they can perhaps reach out to the clinic for help, attend a peer support meeting, but they won't get that reinforcement. They won't feel that effect. So there's those three different aspects to it. Uh, there's also then if someone's going and getting these medications from a medical setting, there's no needles, there's no drug dealers, there's less overdose, and you can integrate and promote psychosocial care into those environments, which is so key. Because again, we are in modern day conceptualizing addiction as a biopsychosocial problem. So this allows you to not worry so much about worrying about those cravings, about those that maybe compulsive use patterns, and just focusing on that psychosocial side. It also can provide structure and accountability if that's something that someone can use. 
Uh, say if you're going to a methadone a clinic every day to get your dose. Now granted, that also can produce a lot of structural barriers and cause problems, but sometimes having those frequent touch points can be very useful for folks in their early recovery phase. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned before, the first line medications we have for opioid use disorder are buprenorphine, uh, usually combined with naloxone at the same time, uh, as well as methadone. Now, the buprenorphine naloxone combination it is a partial agonist, a long ha has a long half-life, so it has less physical dependence than methadone, generally speaking, easier taper. The naloxone is not bioavailable when taken <clears throat> sublingually or orally, which is usually how it's delivered. However, if you were to inject it uh, or alter it in some way, then the naloxone would take effect. So that's the purpose of that being there. It doesn't precipitate withdrawal if used normally, but it's there to help with uh, misuse. Uh, rates. There's a higher dropout rate though with buprenorphine than with methadone in part because it is a lot more convenient. You oftentimes will be getting buprenorphine from a pharmacy maybe uh, once a week or even once a month versus methadone which you generally have to go in for every day. Now methadone is a full agonist that has a long half-life uh, so it's got that full agonist kick though so if someone has, is on too high of a dose they can tend to feel very sedated. Uh, we have to watch out for that. But just like with buprenorphine, it's got that long half-life so that you can just use it once a day and not have the up and down roller coaster of the opioids that are more commonly misused. It is the most established opioid substitute. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Again, generally requires daily or very frequent clinic visits. But a lot of times I feel like people give methadone a, a bad rap, but there's comparable efficacy for both substances. Uh, methadone and buprenorphine both show positive outcomes and about the same positive outcomes. One is just a bit more convenient. Uh, it's easier to use, buprenorphine is, uh, and you've got that naloxone that's integrated for that extra level of safety. The third option is naltrexone. And naltrexone actually is an opioid antagonist, as I mentioned, so it's a non-narcotic. So it's a less intense treatment. It's not necessarily, uh, you're not going to over-medicate someone with naltrexone, for example, in the same way you might with uh, with methadone. However, aside from some more uh, experimental, although seemingly successful models, you do have to be off of all opioids for seven days to begin treatment with naltrexone, and that can be very difficult uh, for some folks to do uh, if they've been misusing opioids, to take those seven days without. Uh, again, there are, there are some options being researched that allow for a quicker induction, and, and you're welcome to look into those if you're interested. But for the most part, if someone's looking to use this, you'd have to wait a little bit to get them on it. You can take naltrexone orally or with a depot injection, which provides a 28-day extended release. So if we're worried about somebody, or if they're worried as well, about just discontinuing their use and then uh, of, of naltrexone and then going back to using uh, other opioids, this would lock that treatment in for four weeks at a time. It also impacts the reward system. Uh, so it's FDA approved for alcohol use disorder as well and reducing cravings there. So not just on the opioid side. So this again, highly efficacious. There are some studies that show without one of these medications, without uh, med medications for addiction treatment, MOUDs, 90 to 80% of opioid users will relapse within the first year, which is a very high amount. So with these medications, you've got 60 to 80% treatment retention and about a 15% rate of going back to use within the first year. So dramatically more effective, which is why it's always worthwhile to have that available as an option when possible to patients. They may not ac accept it, but it's good to have it there. In terms of barriers, uh, stigma is one where they'll feel like I'm just changing out one addiction for another, which is actually not accurate. Uh, there's a huge difference between someone who's stable on methadone or buprenorphine and someone who's actively using drugs off the street. Uh, in their life, in their psychology, it makes a huge difference. Uh, there also can be some logistical barriers, both from the provider standpoint, are these medications available, as well as can the patient get there? And that's particularly an issue for methadone. Now, other forms of harm reduction I just want to touch on briefly. Um, there are non-treatment types of harm reduction. So again, protecting people from the consequences, the worst consequences of use before they're ready to potentially make other health-related changes. Um, so there are test strips. This is something where <clears throat> many public health departments have this available, where you can take some of a drug, uh, mix it with, in with some water, di dip a test strip into it, and see whether or not it's positive for fentanyl, 
for xylazine. And what we found actually is that these are effective. They do not promote the use of drugs. We found that as well. But if they turn positive, people will listen to them. They will, they will see that they, they will not use that batch if there's fentanyl because people don't want to die from an overdose. And so if they know that something's been contaminated, their behavior will change as a result. Another form of non-treatment harm reduction just to be aware of are things like needle exchanges and safe consumption sites. These again, needle exchanges are about preventing the spread of infectious disease. Safe consumption sites or safe injection sites are, uh, are places where people go when, where there's a, usually a nurse present to if somebody overdoses, reverse it. They generally do not provide the substances, but they do provide medical attention if someone overdoses. And I think to date, there have literally been zero overdoses at these facilities. So while they, while we could certainly talk a bit about potential areas for improvement on being a touch point to higher levels of care, at bare minimum, they, are, they do appear to be effective at not uh, allowing someone to overdose if they're using in a supervised environment. Now, one thing that is not actually related to harm reduction that I want to touch on briefly is the use of THC or marijuana products. This has been floated as a potential solution, uh, but it does not show that in the data. We've actually found in the, the data that I've seen that patients are less likely to stay, <clears throat> to stay sober if they're uh, using THC products and marijuana. There's one for alcohol treatment that found, again, fewer days sober. There was a National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine study that found it was not the case. Uh, here's one specifically looking at opioids that found that tw in 26 cases, it was not the case. They, they, they were smoking marijuana in an attempt to avoid relapsing. In each case, it increased cravings and urges. Here's another one looking at that. Can it be a substitute for non-medical opioid use? This one found something very similar, and actually the odds of opioid use appeared to be doubled on days where cannabis was used. Here's another study looking at the same thing where it did not, it was not protective in any way. So just wanted to touch on that briefly, uh, that this is not anywhere close to an evidence-based strategy for getting off of opioids. Uh, so last section then, and we've talked about harm reduction models, let's talk a little bit about then what you can do, specifically how do you enact these models in clinic. So one thing that you can do is detect when a problem is present the second is provide education <clears throat> to the patient about opioid use disorder, about the risks, and then what the path forward can look like. And then lastly is providing treatment or referring out. And we'll touch briefly on each of those areas now. So first, in terms of assessing for opioid use disorders, um, is someone, how much are they taking? Do they deviate from their prescribed dose? Like sometimes folks will uh, not take their, their dose for a couple of days, have more on hand, take more on other days. Uh, why do they do that? What you can do by asking questions like this is determine the risk level of both chemical dependence as well as uh, over overdose risk related to that dose. If this isn't, say, for example, a new patient who you haven't worked with before. There's also a screening questionnaire called the Current Opioid Misuse Measure that you're welcome to look into if you're interested that provides a, a patient self-report of different characteristics that may indicate misuse of an opioid prescription. It's always best when you're assessing for behavioral health concerns to look for a convergence between different types of data. So talking to someone and then also seeing a self-report form is gonna be more valid than just talking with them. You can check the prescription drug monitoring program, which is always an important uh, element to making sure that someone's not misusing prescriptions. I'd recommend looking at that before prescribing any uh, potential substance of misuse that someone can become addicted to. You also want to make sure you're aware of risk factors of opioid use disorders like uh, being in pain or chronic pain, other behavioral health diagnoses, uh, substance use disorder concerns, and then currently taking benzodiazepines, again, is highly related to overdose risk. On the education front, what you can do is discuss the risks and benefits of opioids before prescribing them, as well as any potential non-opioid options for treatment. Make sure that we're thinking about what is the best match for the patient and their problem. And if you are talking about risk, actually make sure we talk about the potential uh, of chemical dependency and that it's okay to talk to you about that. A lot of times what happens is that a problem will develop, a patient will be uh, essentially too anxious to share that with you. And so it grows in secret. You don't even know that it's going on. But if you can work to destigmatize that conversation, just be very open about it from jump, that can go a long way towards the patient telling you if there's a problem and then you being able to work them uh, work on them with that together. Uh, it's worth mentioning as well, chemical dependency is a normal 
bodily adaptation to certain levels of opioids over a period of time. So certainly you're not necessarily going to see a chemical dependency develop with a low dose of hydrocodone over a couple of days. But if say someone is going in for a surgical procedure or if you are prescribing something monthly for chronic pain, worth mentioning it, making sure that they know they can talk to you about it, that you're safe, that you'll help them through it. And it's not like uh, if they tell you about it, that you're going to punish them or just you know basically send them into withdrawal or to a hospital or something like that. You can also, if you are prescribing for a time-limited reason, like, a, like say a surgery, the importance of medication disposal and then where they can do it. Because when you particularly look at young people and where they're getting their opioids from, taking leftover pills from, or extra pills from adults and family and friends is one of the primary places that they get them from. So really talking about how do you dispose of these and not just keep them in the medicine cabinet for later. On the treatment front, you can treat in clinic. And actually about a month ago, I believe, uh, or so prior to the recording of this video, the FDA is starting a campaign for primary care providers called Prescribe with Confidence about specifically trying to equip you with knowledge and skills that you feel like you need to prescribe buprenorphine in particular with confidence. You don't always have to refer out. These are medications that you can prescribe and that you can manage in clinic. There used to be something called an X waiver that you needed to prescribe buprenorphine for OUD. That is no longer the case. That has been removed. And you can look at OUD as a chronic health condition that you can manage from primary care. Uh, ideally, again, psychosocial factors matter. Ideally, you hook someone in with behavioral health, either integrated or a specialist, more on that in a second. But it's not that you cannot manage this in any way or that you cannot prescribe buprenorphine. Because again, if you get somebody off of street medications and on to buprenorphine, they will be better off from a health perspective. Now, when do you refer out for specialty care? Assuming again that uh, you, you, you have it available to you. Uh, questions to ask yourself, what's the risk for harm? Is this person, are they using street drugs or are they a, at risk for overdose? Uh, and then also what's the trajectory? Is this getting worse over time? Is it holding steady? Does it seem to be getting better on its own? Are they, say, willing to try a, a taper if, say, they're uh, misusing their medication slowly with you? Uh, or are they not? Do they want to participate <clears throat> in the first place? That also matters a lot in terms of the trajectory. Uh, treatment engagement, though, is a protective factor against overdose. So whether or not that's engaging in treatment for OUD with you or with a specialist, engagement and treatment is useful. Uh, further reading that we won't go deep into today, uh, but is the ASAM criteria. It was recently updated to its fourth edition. And the way that in, uh, in the, like the full model for where do we place people, the different dimensions that are looked at are what is the their state in terms of use, withdrawal, medications? Do they have any biomedical, so uh, health-related conditions that are impacting their addiction? Do they have any psychiatric and cognitive conditions that interplay with this, like depression, uh, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder? Are they having any other substance use related risks? Do they have a good place to go? You know, like, are they living in an environment where lots of people are using that can make it very hard to change in a positive way? And uh, are there any other individual considerations that we need to think about before placing? So these could be things like, say, motivation. And if so, what might help them along that path? So some general referral guidelines for you. Um, make sure that the treatment that you're suggesting will account not just for the opioid use, but also whatever is driving it. Because a lot of times folks who have an opioid use disorder are also struggling with say something psychiatric um, and making sure that we account for everything is very important. Matching the modality to the individual is important. It's not a one size fit all, uh, fits all, uh, as well as uh, payers. So make sure that you know where you'd like someone to go if they're on public aid of some sort or Medicaid, if they have commercial insurance. If you don't know where you like to send folks, or if you don't have behavioral health integrated, where you can have them do a consult and they'll know where to go, it's really important to have those, uh, your, your favorites on the top of your head so that if someone's at a place where they're willing to accept help, you can actually direct them to, to, to a place where they can get that help. So just basic, again, just very basic overview of treatment options here. There are outpatient options for care, like working with an individual therapist, an intensive outpatient program for three hours a day, or partial hospitalization program, or PHP for short, for six hours a day. Inpatient options can include detox facilities to get someone off of opioids uh, if, if need be, as well as residential environments. 
if you're referring out to always make sure to watch for accreditation the program should have joint commission carf or coa the council on accreditation one of those three third-party accreditation bodies uh, if that's not there that's a big uh, big red flag uh, so that being said to sum everything up from today uh, the opioid epidemic it is still here despite all of our efforts it's an ongoing issue and COVID actually made it a lot worse that said there are people in the pipeline towards addiction or overdose. Although accidental fentanyl exposure absolutely exists, a lot of people are on this progression of getting worse over time. And if we can have them feel safe enough to talk to us about it, if we can provide care earlier on, that's part of us doing our part to reduce that level of overdose death. So watch for those opportunities for earlier intervention. Fentanyl right now is very present in the illicit drug markets and then xylazine which is the sedative and the nitazines, which is another synthetic opioid definitely growing. As individual clinicians, we can detect emerging or existing problems. We can educate patients about inherent risks and harm reduction guidelines if they are still using, and then provide or refer to treatment services if those services are desired. So if you're interested in more information, places that you can look are uh, the Providers Clinical Support System. Uh, tremendous amount of information on there, high quality, uh, well-researched webinars, uh, CMEs, all for free, I believe, as well, or the vast majority for free. Uh, there's the provider uh, primary care providers can prescribe with confidence campaign that the FDA just launched. And then actually the American Academy of Family Physicians has created a guide to treating opioid use disorder in family medicine as a chronic condition. And it's worth absolutely worth looking that over. It's a couple years old, so it does make re reference to that X waiver, which no longer applies. But aside from that, there's a lot of very solid evidence-based principles that encourage you to take a look at. And those should be also provided in the supplementary materials for this training. So thank you again so much for your time uh, and, and attention for this presentation and this critically important topic. Again, uh, I'm Dr. Aaron Weiner. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. And uh, take care, and I hope to see you in another training.